Welcome, everybody. I'm, I'm Angie Sally Krupp. I'm the Chief Strategy and Development Officer at the Keck Medicine of USC Department of Surgery. I'm actually here today with our esteemed uh, surgeons of the Division of Thoracic Surgery. We've got uh, the Chief of the Division, Dr. Tony Kim, with us along with Dr. Sean Whiteman, Dr. Elizabeth David, and Dr. Scott Atai. Um, we're here today because we frequently uh, get questions about COVID-19 and lung disease. Um, so we've gathered the best group of people here uh, in the department to help answer some of those questions. So what I'm gonna do guys, and I really want this to be as informal and conversational as, as we can make it because this is, we're all stand to learn something here. Um, so I'm gonna run through the questions here as they are, have been written and, and given to me. First, how does coronavirus affect the lungs? Well, I think coronavirus affects the lungs in a, a, a variety of ways. And if you look at sort of the clinical presentation of it, it can be, it can range from the asymptomatic presentation all the way to uh, a, a destroyed lung that can uh, render the patient incapable of breathing on their own. And as such, the radiographic findings can, it can mirror that too. You can have maybe uh, just small infiltrates on the lungs all the way to a destroyed lung. So I don't know that there's a classic way per se. I think we're seeing a whole variety of uh, um, of uh, presentations, and I think it's largely owed to the fact that uh, it's affecting people differently along the way. Yeah, I think that um, the um, fact that the disease is novel to humans here relatively recently, we're still kind of learning what its actual effect is. We know that um, in patients who have succumbed to the disease, it is a fairly severe um, injury to the lung itself with some features that aren't seen in other types of infections. As an example, small blood clots that seem to be forming inside of the lungs, which are preventing blood flow to those aspects of the lungs and, and not allowing oxygen or gas to get to where it needs to be and also leading to severe injury to those areas where they don't receive enough blood flow and then they really, that part of the lung can't survive, which might account for why the recovery for these uh, individuals affected can be fairly prolonged. So that, that being said, would somebody that has um, had either lung or esophageal cancer, are they at a higher risk to get COVID? And what does their recovery maybe look like? So I think patients with um, lung or esophageal cancers um, often have many of the predisposing risk factors that set pa patients up for poorer outcomes with COVID-19. And so some of those um, disease processes or medical problems would be um, having a history of smoking, having COPD, having um, high blood pressure, having congestive heart failure. Um, all of those diseases can be associated with lung and esophageal cancer. And then again, it, it also sets the patients up for more severe outcomes if they were to acquire COVID-19. But that being said, a cancer diagnosis in during the time of this pandemic, it's very important to take that seriously and to continue to seek medical care. Um, I think we're going to talk about some of the novel ways we're taking care of patients right now, but it is it is crucial that a cancer diagno diagnosis not be ignored right now because the death rates from cancers are still higher than the death rates from COVID-19. Are, are there any particular things that we're doing here at Keck Medicine to keep those patients safe? So I think that, um, you know, we're, we're doing the best we can to keep COVID patients very separate from non-COVID patients um, in terms of isolating the patients themselves, in terms of having separate teams uh, care for those patients. So there's very little overlap between um, the caregivers and the patients, really trying to keep the two populations very, very separate. Right. I just wanted to add on to that point, which is, you know, the CDC is predicting there's going to be a cancer fallout uh, from this sort of the COVID patients, uh, uh, rightly so to some degree, gaining greater attention in this time period. And, and so the cancer patients 
Uh, some of them uh, nationwide might fall off the grid, so to speak. But I think one thing for us in our group philosophically is that we we recognize that cancer is just as uh, important and as lethal of a disease as COVID, uh, to Dr. David's point. And so um, we, we uh, philosophically took it as a priority that we wanted to still make sure that our patients got the appropriate cancer care during this time. So that actually brings me to another question here and that a lot of people have been asking, you know, they, they come on campus and they see everybody wearing a, um, a green sticker. What what does that represent to people? You got your st- you've got your stickers on. That's good. So that represents that we've been screened. So we are screened every day. Um, we walk in the door. We uh, sanitize our hands. We put a face mask on. We get our temperature checked, and we get our sticker. And we're asked um, a series of questions about whether or not we have any symptoms uh, or if we've been exposed knowingly to anyone with COVID. Um, And right now that is the best we can do to protect our workforce and our patients. And for the record, we're behind closed doors. That's why we're not wearing face masks right now. Yes, (laughs) I I was just gonna say, that's the reason we don't wear them right now. I also know just from my role, looking at, at surgery as an entire department is the way that we're scheduling appointments is different. We're, we're spreading people out. Um, so there's not a bunch of people in the waiting room. And, and I know that we're being really thoughtful about those things as well. So if you're a patient coming here for care, um, this, is, this is one of the safer places that you could probably be right now. Um, okay, back to my FAQs here. Uh, how, do you operate on COVID patients? Sure. So, um, so the answer, I guess, is yes and no. Um, I'll start with the no. So for patients who are diagnosed with COVID or actively infected with COVID, we are not performing elective operations on them. Elective being we are not operating on them for a, a cancer, for example. We are not operating on them for uh, who need a knee replacement or something along those lines. So um, for someone who has active COVID, who's uh, currently infected, we are not performing elective surgery on them. On the other side of the coin, the yes is there are patients who have COVID-19, who have diseases that require urgent or emergent intervention, or require treatment in the context of COVID. An example of one of the more common procedures in this setting is a tracheostomy or a placement of a breathing tube into the neck. Those procedures are still done on COVID patients. Drainage procedures in the chest, those are still done on COVID patients. So if someone is actively infected and requires intervention, it will be performed in the appropriate manner. And to the to address maybe a little bit back to the prior question, Keck has arranged um, operating rooms that are COVID only. So we have uh, isolated rooms, isolated teams, so that if we do have to perform surgery on patients who are actively infected, they are completely isolated away from non-COVID patients who may be coming in electively. They never really uh, uh, cross paths, so to speak. So Dr. David, I wanna come back to something that you said, and it's one of our, our the questions that we get frequently, uh, just about people not ignoring their, their health and actually seeking care. Um, telemedicine, what can any one of you tell me about how that works do surgeons do telemedicine? It's not something that I would, I would automatically assume if I need uh, to see a surgeon that I would talk to them over the, over the video like this. What can you guys tell us about how it works and, and do people like it? How often do you offer it? Um, anything that might give somebody an understanding of that, uh, what telehealth is? Surgeons definitely uh, can do appointments via telemedicine, and we definitely do here um, regularly, and especially during uh, this era of COVID-19. We've been doing a lot, a majority of our visits over telemedicine, and as a division, actually, we were doing telemedicine before COVID-19 because uh, many of our patients have a distance to travel, and we're trying to accommodate to that. Um, But just like all telemedicine appointments, uh, telemedicine appointments for a, a surgeon, the physical exam component is a little more limited over video, but we still can accomplish a lot and get to know 
the patient and explain the imaging and talk about operations. But uh, if an operation is needed eventually, um, we do want to meet the patient. And so at some point we'll want an in-person visit, be at additional time or the morning of surgery. Um, even once COVID-19 uh, is improved in our community, we still want to continue to offer telemedicine just for the convenience because some patients need that, especially if they have a distance to travel. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the probably biggest advantages I've noticed is a lot of our patients are older and have adult children. And using telemedicine, we've actually been able to incorporate a lot more family members into the visits um, which has enabled some of those adult children to participate and, you know, directly hear what we're saying, hear the surgical discussion, see the pictures from the CAT scans. Um, and I think it helps their parents with their medical decision making. So it's a, it's a real enhancement, I think, to our practice. That's an incredible benefit. I mean, I think that's one that people don't uh, automatically think of, but I'm glad you brought that up. 